A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. Hello and welcome. I'm Tim Farron and this is the show where you get to hear from a Christian who works either in or through the mucky business of politics. You might think that politics is tainted by compromise and sin. Well, of course, you'd be right, wouldn't you? But then again, so is everything else. And so has everything else been since the fall. And I think Christians should be praying for their brothers and sisters who are in politics in an informed way. Today, we'll be joined by Andrew Hawkins, who's the founder of the polling company, Savanta Comres. Andrew has recently founded Democracy 3.0, a new website which has been set up to help people campaign on a variety of issues. We'll hear more about this and his career impacting politics from the outside in a moment or two. But before that, I'd like to talk about the obvious. Who would have believed that a drinks party could cause outrage and even lead to the demise of a prime minister? The thing about parties is that they tend to be, by their nature, a light-hearted matter. So when is a party more than just a party? The answer is not when it is a work event. Instead, it is when having a party or parties constitutes hypocrisy, dishonesty and arrogance. Millions of people made huge sacrifices in the name of containing the COVID-19 virus, protecting the NHS and protecting one another and complying with the rules that had been set in place by the government. Remember, this was not simply guidance, it was the law. People were arrested and fined thousands of pounds for flouting them. And yet the government that handed them down and the prime minister in charge of them seems to have been repeatedly breaking them with jollity and ease. The image of Her Majesty the Queen sat alone at the funeral of her beloved husband of 74 years is powerful and moving. It was last April at the time. Now, however, it stands as representative of all those who made bitter and painful sacrifices. It contrasts with a somewhat different understanding of leadership, duty and sacrifice on the part of our Prime Minister. What has shocked us most is that these were not just one-off mistakes. Instead, they appear to reflect an attitude at the heart of number 10, a belief that the rules simply did not apply to them. As Christians, we believe that God has given humans a duty of stewardship of our world, and this includes the responsibility to govern with integrity and justice. Leaders must then set an example and build a culture of trust. But this failure of trust also highlights a deeper and fairly recent trend about the very nature of truth, which should concern Christians deeply. We must always hold out forgiveness, knowing that we too are sinners in desperate need of God's mercy. But as sinners, we must accept that that is what we are. Sadly, those in government have twisted and turned in all directions on this to deny any wrongdoing. Truth has taken a backseat to whatever it is politically convenient to ask people to believe. This didn't begin with number 10 parties. It is a poison throughout our culture and especially in politics. When facts stop mattering, we begin to make our decisions based on who we like the best and who we want to win the argument, no matter what they are actually saying. That's the culture war for you. And it's why Christians should steer well clear. Because how can we ever believe what any politician or any other person says if the truth is seen as just a commodity to be picked up or discarded when it suits us? As Christians, we're commanded to value the truth. We should care deeply then about this situation. We have a responsibility not to accept or to spread falsehoods and to count them where we have the tools to do so. We need to remind ourselves that someone might say something we strongly disagree with but this does not mean that they are a liar. Similarly, someone we approve of might say something we like the sound of, but it does not mean that it's true. In a democracy, we expect sometimes to be governed by those with whom we disagree. But when those who make the rules repeatedly demonstrate that they are untruthful and untrustworthy, they lose their authority to continue in that role. We should stand ready to forgive, but we must not make excuses or seek to deflect just because the offender is in our tribe. But I don't want to leave you too depressed. Let's remember that our hope is in the most amazing truth that has ever been revealed. God came to earth to die in our place so that we can spend eternity with him. One day, the travails of Boris Johnson and COVID and office parties that people thought were work events will all be ancient history. 
All this matters and we will live through the consequences of it, but it's temporary. Do not lose hope. Keep praying for our political leaders to seek and embody the truth and wisdom that our country needs right now and keep living faithfully for Christ in the sure and certain hope that one day he will put all things to rights. A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. So to today's guest, Andrew Hawkins, the founder of polling company Savanta Comrades and director of new campaign platform Democracy 3.0. Andrew, it's an absolute blessing to have you with us. How are you? Yeah, great. Thanks. It's wonderful to, to be here and to see you, Tim. Well, let's start with um, the question we always ask our guests first about their own personal faith. How did you come to know the Lord Jesus? Well, I, I, I had the great privilege of being born into a Christian family uh, with, a, with a stable um, family background. Uh, and then in my teens, we, we went to, to quite a, I'd describe an exuberant church when I was growing up, which I, I kicked against pretty hard in my, in my teens and went to university and um, uh, read philosophy. And that really introduced me to the idea of if there is a, if there is a God uh, and, and I don't believe in him, then the consequences for me could be fairly serious. Now, that doesn't get you to the gospel. It didn't get me to the gospel. It was only really when I started work in, in London um, thanks to one kind lady I worked with, Catherine, you know who you are, who persevered and took me along, dragged me along to evangelistic events. And, and then my, my girlfriend at the time um, was nagging me to go to church and she went off on medical elective to Africa. And I thought, great, while she's away, I'll find a church on my terms and she can't complain when she comes back. And I wandered into All Souls Langham Place one day mm. and uh, had the gospel preached to me and the, the other great thing about this is that that girlfriend is now my wife. Oh, wonderful. We love we love happy endings. Um, <laughs> however, however, we're only a minute into the interview, so we'll keep going. But that's fantastic. And and so, uh, obviously, fast forward, um, this is the terrible thing about a relatively short interview. We have to miss out really important things about your life, Andrew. But in 2003, I think I'm right in saying you established a well-known polling company, Savanta Comres. How did that come about? Yes, I I drifted into polling in the nineties, and I was working for, a, for for this lobbying company at the time, and um, went off and ran the political research unit of another polling firm, and ended up um, uh, holding uh, holding the fort. Uh, my boss left, and I was left with the Conservative Party account during what John Major came to describe as his eighteen month winter, when he was challenged for the leadership by John Red, Redwood, and of course then the run up to the disastrous nineteen ninety seven election. Uh, um, and learned a huge amount during during that time. But I, I I could see that the polling industry was changing. The supply chain was 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 breaking down. Barriers to entry were breaking down. And I thought this is the moment. This, the, in, especially in the wake of of Tony Blair. I mean, I think mean, mm. Blair was the first prime minister who first sort of governed by uh, newspaper headlines. And correspondingly, therefore, there was a great surge in demand for for polling to understand the mood of the public. Mm. Now, um, to where we are today, uh, nearly 20 years on from you establishing Savanta Comres, you have a new venture, uh, which is related but very different, Democracy 3.0. Tell us about it. Yes, well, um, God was very kind to me in the, after 17 years of, of running Comres, um, as it was, about six months before the pandemic broke, um, I, I did a deal for the acquisition of Comres by Savanta. And... Um, that not only spared me the, the burden of furloughing staff and dealing with leases and all the rest of it, but it also gave me the chance to think about what was missing in the whole campaign space. And I'd done a lot of work over the years with online petition companies. And, and Tim, as an MP, you'll be familiar with the bombardment of templated emails that you get and the way that some of these organisations work. And my contention is, and I think the experience of others is that Online petitions are fine as far as they go, but they don't actually change anything. And in contrast, we have crowdfunding platforms that sometimes will divert funds to the originator of that, of that crowdfunding project or elsewhere. And what, I, what I'm trying to do is, is bring the resources to ordinary people that an international NGO or a, or a global business might have, if they come up with the right idea, they can come onto the Democracy 3 platform, they can 
generate support in the name by, by virtue of, of uh, the online petition uh, names and using those names, using those contacts, they can then ask people to dip into their pocket for a few quid to fund some professional campaigning for them. So it's really to bring those the campaigns to life, great ideas to life. And over the years, we've worked with, I've worked with so many organizations that have, that have got really great causes but they're held together with sellotape and string. Mm. They deserve much better resourcing than they've got. So that's what I'm trying to do. And that gives, a, I mean, a whole different uh, set of questions about lobbying, but it gives access to lobbying the most powerful people in the land on the part of people with actually relatively few resources. That's, that's the plan. That's the vision. Um, and if we, can, if we can achieve that, then it means that it really does democratise the lobbying process. That's, that's my goal. A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. We're speaking with Andrew Hawkins, the founder of Savanta Comres and current director and, uh, and founder of Democracy 3.0. Andrew, let's talk a bit more about uh, politics and polling. But first, Christians and how we are sometimes misrepresented, maybe by accident, by pollsters. Tell us about that. Yeah, this has been this has been a, a, a constant irritation to me throughout my time at Comrades, where we were working for uh, one organisation after another, and you'd find that that some bright spark would put out a poll of inverted commas Christians, when they had simply used the census question to filter out people who were not who cul- who identified culturally as something other than Christian. It's a classic thing. You go to the hospital, you tick a box to say C of E rather than Muslim or anything else, and it doesn't really tell you anything about people's beliefs. And this was this best summed up by the 2001 census, in which around a third of a million people self-identified as Jedi. Now, anyone, of course, who's watched Star Wars will know <clears throat> that this is not a real a real religion, but it was they they did that to make a point. And in fact, in that census, more people identified as Jedi than they did as Jewish or Buddhist. So that just tells you how difficult it is to actually anchor the number of Christians in the reality of the census. And the census question is a voluntary question. So that's just impossible. So um, we set up a, a faith research unit to try and counter this. I don't think there is any perfect way of, of doing it. But the what I would say to, to Christians is when you see a poll of Christians and the results seem surprising, mm-hmm. dig deep. Ask what the filter questions are. Um, because, of course, Christians themselves don't always agree on who is a Christian or not, let alone people out there with an agenda. And that's something that we just constantly have to do battle with. So taking it all with a pinch of salt is, is important. I'm sure politicians, I know politicians might take opinion polls with a pinch of salt, but they also take polls very seriously. How do you think um, today's leaders, and we'll talk topically about uh, Boris Johnson in particular, uh, how, how do they look at opinion polls? How does it affect their decision making? Uh, in the same way that that somebody selling a, a product or a service for a company is not going to go to market without having tested the product to destruction, having tested the messaging around its sales. So, <clears throat> so politicians um, were, are exactly the same of, of, across across all parties and across all major major issues. Of course, politicians say that the only opinion poll that counts is the one on election day. <clears throat> You'll be familiar with that, Tim. But the, the reality is that that um, every leader will be nervously looking at, at their poll ratings. Um, Gordon Brown was, of course, notorious for it was said that he would be in, working in the middle of the night, get up in the middle of the night to pour over opinion poll tables, which is not something I'd recommend for anybody um, to do. Um, but at the same time, I think it is it is important for politicians to understand the mood of the public, to understand what their fears are, what their aspirations are. And of course, you might say, I would say this, wouldn't I, as a, as a pollster, but I think it's actually really good for people to have their voices heard, even if it is through uh, an opinion poll rather than direct face-to-face. Face-to-face is important, but mm. polls actually serve as a really important pressure valve. Mm. I've been obviously this last few days with the pressure that the current prime minister is under. I'm doing a little bit of ear wigging um, uh, in the corridors of power last night here to Conservative MPs. They've been their constituencies of the weekend. 
I've been in mine listening to people knocking on doors. And you might get, I mean, I may have spoken to, I don't know, 50 or 60 people over the weekend whose doors I knocked on and had decent conversations with. That's not scientific, but I'll get a feel about how people are thinking, how people are moving. Um, you can have much more structured versions of that through uh, through, through uh, of the, the kind of um, groups that you pull together um, and find out how people are thinking. And then you have the more scientific polling. Um, those focus groups that I was talking about, those um, uh, balanced and weighted opinion polls, what's the value of those two different kinds of research? Well, I'd, I'd want to say that I think, <clears throat> I think the, the, the British polling industry um, is actually a world leader on, on all of these methods. And the world comes to Britain for that kind of expertise for, for both types. And the big difference is that with, with the with big opinion polls, and they, they are very, very sophisticated these days, and you can do uh, statistical modeling based on a national poll and work out right down to street level based on what we know about the demographic distribution at street level, postcode level across the country. You can work out broadly what people are gonna be thinking in very great detail. And, and that's to understand the what question. If you want to understand the why question, why do people hold particular views or behave in a certain way? That's when your the focus group um, thing comes in. And sometimes, you know, I think there's a lot of a lot of focus group output is it, it's there to drive uh, a quote in a in a newspaper story to justify a line or an angle that the paper is taking. But every mm. once in a while, a focus group will come up with a silver bullet, and mm. you'll you'll be racking your brains thinking, how on earth can we try and get this message across more succinctly, or or why is it that people oppose such and such? And a focus group held correctly, don't run correctly, can tell you that. What it can't do is tell you what the public at large is thinking about any kind of issue or, or any politician at all. And so phrases like get Brexit done sort of famously comes out of talking to, to people. And, yeah, and I've, I've sat in focus groups where suddenly out of a corner of the room has, has just frothed up uh, a slogan or, mm. or, a, or an angle. And you think that's quite interesting. Let's test it in the next group. And then the next group comes to life and the next group and that comes to life. Mm. And it, it's, <clears throat> it's a thing of beauty when it works, but it works yeah. seldom like that. And in terms of what, I mean, as I say, given it is the issue of the moment, what should Conservative MPs and Conservative uh, managers and the leader himself, what should they be looking for to help them to decide whether it's right or not for Boris Johnson to carry on as prime minister. Let's ignore the morality for a moment. Let's ignore, let's just think about the, the practicality, the electability. What are the, what are the things that ought to make them decide to either stick or to twist? The, the, these sorts of questions, Tim, are, <clears throat> are really tough because the history, recent history is littered with examples of politicians that have overreacted or underreacted to events. And I think back to 2014, one famous opinion poll splashed on the front page of the Sunday Times, led to mass panic uh, around the Scottish ref independence referendum mm. and the splashing of billions of pounds of taxpayers' money to assuage the voters in Scotland and persuade them to remain part of the, the union. On the other hand, when the expenses scandal broke, uh, Westminster went to ground, everyone pretended that, that this wasn't happening and that voters weren't disturbed by it. I think for my advice to Conservative MPs would be to look at what this means for them, not necessarily for the Prime Minister. It's all very well for voters to say in the polls that the Prime Minister should stand down. What does it mean for, if I were a Tory MP, what would it mean for me to stand by the Prime Minister? Mm. Um, and what, I mean, that, that is, a, a, if you like, a selfish and venal answer, but politics is sometimes a, a selfish business and you, one has to look after one's own interest to stay in office. And, and um, that's why I think some of, the, some of the answers to that can only come out of conversations with constituents at mm. constituency level, mm. because an opinion poll won't tell you on a constituency by constituency basis what your voters are thinking in response to what a particular MP is, is saying about that issue. Yeah, well, that sort of leads me nicely to... Another question about um, how opinion polls can affect the way politicians think and act and introduce policy. There is, of course, a charge that polls uh, make 
politicians be their worst selves um, and they simply chase the popular rather than doing the right. How, how would you respond to that? I, I think politicians that, that, simply, that simply chase the popular are ultimately on a, on a hiding to nothing because the, the public can be quite fickle and they, they can be, this is not, I'm not, not um, taking for granted um, uh, the, the great British voter at, at all, in, in any way at all, but um, the simple, a simple percentage of support for a particular issue um, says nothing about the strength of support and nothing about the trade-offs that politicians have to make between often suboptimal outcomes. So I think politicians need to be very careful about simply chasing opinion polls. And I think when they the, when they have chased um, po polling popularity, occasionally it's led to disaster. But actually, sometimes it's led to it's led to politicians um, listening to people and and actually being very responsive. And ultimately. I think the public is in a rather different place today. I think there's an expectation that politicians will do the popular thing. And I, and I suppose I've been thinking over recent weeks in, in relation to things like the, the, the sage forecasts that mm. we've seen and the use of experts, the use of, use of statistics. I think if, if we didn't have opinion polls, I don't think the public are, are in any mood to, to turn around and roll over when politicians say, Trust me, I've seen the data. I've seen the statistics. I know what's going to happen, and we're you know this this may hurt, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, and so I think opinion polling at the moment is is actually a really helpful pressure valve for for voter angst and and voter enthusiasm for for what the government should be doing. A final one, Andrew. Um, when sometimes we don't like the message, we can shoot the messenger. To what extent have you? had uh, politicians, senior otherwise, pick up the phone and shout at you and they didn't like what you'd said or what you'd that, found. That's, that, yes, that, that is, um, that's, a, that's a, a frequent thing. I, fortunately, I find that, that politicians are a forgiving bunch and generally speaking, not universally, but generally, once the election is over, we can all be friends again. But, that, but I, do, I do recall one particular instance of doing some polling for ITV News in the run up to the 2015 election when we we found that there was one party that was about to lose most of its seats in the southwest of England <laughs> and uh, uh, its then leader at the time had a right old popped us. Um, we're all friends again now so uh, <laughs> I think that's just I think politics does does run on slightly different rules from from the rest of normal life and that's Quite a good thing if you're if you're getting into the ring and, and slugging it out one day and you need to work together the next. Yeah, a good message was already. I have no idea who you could possibly talking be talking about. Um, yes, yeah, so if we can if we retain our bitterness, um, then well, a we're not going to be very good witness, and and b you're not going to be happy in politics. Andrew, thanks very much for what you do and for the time that you've given us, um, for your uh, faithful obedience towards God and, and for doing such a wonderful uh, job in the world that you have been placed. Really, we wish you every blessing with Democracy 3.0 and encouraging more people to be active in our democracy. Good to have you with us. Thanks very much, Tim. Each week, we answer a question from you, the listener, about how Christianity and politics can work together. Maybe you're thinking through a particular issue or you're not sure why people disagree on a certain policy. If you've got a question, please write it in in an email to farron at premier.org.uk. We would love to hear from you. Well, this week, Adebayo from Greenwich has been in touch with this question. Hello, Tim. Please, do you think it's Christ-like for an MP like Jacob Rismog to refer to a fellow MP, the Conservative uh, Scottish leader Douglas Ross, as lightweight? Is that Christ-like for him to be dismissive of Douglas's concern about the Prime Minister's conduct? Thank you.
so I, I know both of those characters a little bit. Um, Jacob Rees Mogg, I've always found on a personal level, whatever his image and whatever your opinion of him and other people's opinion, I've always found him personally to be a very courteous person. I was on my way to a refugee event in a really, really hard to find room in the House of Lords about a month before Christmas. I bumped into Jacob Rees Mogg and bless him, he took me all the way to this room. He guy took 10 minutes out of his life to take me to this room and make sure that I could find my way back again. So I always find him to be a, pl a pleasant person. What he said about Douglas Ross, I think, was not pleasant. I think that there is always the temptation in politics to uh, say something that belittles the person because you don't like the thing that they said or the thing that they believe. And as Christians, we should be careful about how we speak about one another. It is hugely tempting, and I'm sure I've crossed the line several times. But I think one of the ways in which Christians can live out their faith in politics is through the way in which we treat and speak about others. There will be times when we may very, very strongly disagree with somebody. And clearly Jacob Rees-Mogg clearly disagrees with his Conservative leader in Scotland over the future of the current Prime Minister and leader of the UK uh, Tory party, Boris Johnson. But you can disagree really quite wildly and deeply with someone and yet still treat them as somebody made in the image of God with kindness and with respect. It's something we all should do as Christians in politics. It's something that sometimes we fail to do. And I'm also guilty occasionally. If you have a question for Tim, email farron at premier.org.uk. We've come to the end of our time together once again, but let's close as we always do and rightly in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for Andrew Hawkins. We thank you for all those involved in, in the industry of polling. And we thank you for those politicians and political managers who interpret that polling and seek to make decisions often on the basis of that um, information. Lord, we just pray for our leaders um, in politics to look at the data that they receive and indeed the feedback that they get through their constituency inboxes and out on the doorsteps. We pray that they would interpret that information with wisdom and seek to serve uh, the people in ways which are right and are godly, um, not seeking to serve themselves, but to serve the greater good and to serve the people who have put them there. Lord, I also just pray at this time of, of hardship for many people that when politicians are thinking about their futures, the future of their leaders, um, whether or not they might be re-elected at the next election, not win or lose the next election, it can make us all terribly selfish and terribly short term in our thinking. And yet there are millions of people out there who need us to make decisions that affect their lives about the cost of living, whether they can afford to pay the rent, or the mortgage or the heating bills or the food bill. Let us in politics think about the people and the people we have been appointed to serve more than we think about ourselves. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for listening. Don't forget, you can catch up on all the shows which have included interviews with party leaders, former government ministers and MPs from all the major parties. Just search for A Mucky Business on your chosen podcast provider or head to premierchristianradio.com forward slash A Mucky Business. See you next time. Thank you.